Math 2414, Partial Fractions, Video 4, Case 1, Unique Linear Factors. All right, this is where the rubber hits the road, where we start building this technique for decomposing a rational function into the sum and difference of its partial fractions. Well, let's speak in generalities for a second. What do I mean by unique linear factors? Well, let's say that we have a rational function that satisfies the degree requirement. Now, we won't be listing any specific degrees, but let's just assume that it satisfies that requirement. Take that over here. And we have some numerator, which we're calling P of X. I guess N of X would have made more sense, but that's what I get for just writing this in the book. Um, and let's say that our denominator has already been factored into a product of unique linear factors. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, a linear factor is a factor whose degree is one. So the highest power that can be in the factor is, is just X. And there might be a number in front and there might be a number added to the end or subtracted. And let's say that it has multiple unique linear factors. And in order to recycle the A's and B's, I'm just gonna subscript them with ones and twos. So A1X plus B1, A2X, B2, and uh, so on. Well, let's go ahead and set up one more. In fact, we'll just, we'll just work under the assumption that there are three unique linear factors. There could be more, there could be less, but for the sake of simplicity, let's just say this one has three. And when I say unique, I mean that no two of these are the same. So it's, it's not the case that A1 equals A2 and B1 equals B2. So in other words, we can't have like two X plus one and another two X plus one. Those aren't unique, those are the same. And it could be something like two X plus two. That would be different, uh, but no two of the factors are the same. So how do we begin trying to decompose this? Well, the answer is for each unique linear factor, in fact, I think this is worth typing in and I'll illustrate it. For each unique linear factor, set up a partial fraction with that factor as a denominator and an unknown constant L. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is each of these linear factors in the denominator will get its own fraction. So the AX1, the A1X plus B1 will get its own fraction. The AX, A2X plus B2 will get its own fraction. And the A3X plus B3 would get its own fraction. And for our numerators, we would just put some unknown constants. Now we can do something like recycle and say, capital A1, capital A2, capital A3. Or if we had a fixed number of fractions, we could just go through the alphabet and say A, B, C or whatever. Um, I may, I'll probably just use different uh, letters for the numerators since we'll have uh, a finite number of fractions each time. But that's the setup for a partial fraction decomposition. Now, the task is going to be figuring out what these constant numerators are. And the trick to doing that is going to be to clear out the fractions. And then there's a couple of ways to go from there. We can either do a system of equations or we can use some, uh, some sleight of hand. Why don't we do an example of a fraction decomposition and then we'll use that for our next example. You may recognize this rational function from the video about the requirement for degrees. X squared plus two X minus one over two X cubed plus three X squared minus two. Notice this does satisfy the degree requirement in the sense that the denominator has a larger power, a larger degree than the numerator. In order to do a partial fraction decomposition though, our denominator must be factored. So I hope your factoring skills are honed. How would we factor, in fact, let's just factor the two X cubed plus three X squared minus two beneath it. How would we factor that? Well, there's a variety of factoring techniques. And if you like a review, I do have some videos over that, just to ask. But the first, first off, I realized that I miswrote something. 
the denominator should be 2x cubed plus 3x squared minus 2x. The reason I caught that is because I knew the first factoring moved to try as greatest common factor, and I remembered this one had a greatest common factor. You can factor an x out of the denominator, leave 2x squared plus 3x minus 2. But then the question is, can we factor that quadratic? And the answer is yes. I'm not going to dilly-dally with how to factor this. I'm just going to do it. 2x squared plus 3x minus 2 factors into 2x plus 1 times x minus 2. And no, it doesn't. I got my signs back. How do I know? Because in my head I foiled it out and it was wrong and now it's right. Don't believe me? Multiply it out. All right, so now we have our denominator factored into a product of unique linear factors, x, 2x minus 1, and x plus 2. That means for our partial fraction decomposition, we're going to set up three fractions, one for each unique linear factor, one for the x, one for the 2x minus 1, one for the x plus 2. And our next move is to try to figure out what the numerators are. And right now, all we know is that they're constants. I'm going to go call those constants capital A, B, and C. And I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this. All right. So we know our partial fraction decomposition it has to be of this form. But now to find the A, B, and C. So how do we do this? Well, the first thing you do is you multiply everything by uh, the denominator, uh, by the denominator of the original polynomial function. And I think I'm going to do me a favor. I think I'm going to erase, I'm not going to erase it, I'm going to cross it out. And I'm going to replace it with what it factored into. So it's the same function, just factored. So well, let's clear out the fractions. And the, the standard way of clearing out fractions in a rational equation is to multiply everything by all the different denominators. So we're going to multiply everything by x, 2x minus 1, and x plus 2. Let's get rid of this example. All right. So x, oops, come back here. Try that again. x, kind of tight here. 2x minus 1. Let's just stack them. x plus 2. x, 2x minus 1 x plus 2, x, 2x minus 1, x plus 2, x, 2x minus 1, x plus 2. All right, on each fraction, there's going to be some cancellations, but by multiplying everything by the original denominator, all the fractions should cancel. In the first fraction, all three factors cancel. And that leaves me with, uh, what does that leave me with? It leaves me with x squared plus 2x minus 1. But on the other fractions, not everything cancels. On the first fraction, only the x's cancel. And that leaves me with the a and the 2x minus 1 and the x plus 2. On the second fraction, the x, excuse me, 2x minus 1's cancel, and that leaves me with the b, the x, and the x plus 2. And on the third fraction, the x plus 2's cancel, and forgive me, I don't know why on this last one I put that fraction bar there. I guess it's just habit when I put one thing on top of each other, uh, top of another. But on all of these multipliers, they're all just products of things. It should not be a fraction bar. It should have been set of parentheses but I digress. The x plus 2's cancel, and that leaves us, us with the x, the c, and the 2x minus 1. Now, do we know a, b, and c? No, we don't. But there's a couple of ways to attack this now. Number one is to bust open all the parentheses on the right, gather like terms in terms of x, and factor them out, then equate left coefficients with right coefficients, creating a system of equations. But I'm going to show you another technique which can be used sometimes straightforward, sometimes a little more indirectly, but always gets the job done. We are assuming 
that this current equation, the one I'm about to highlight, we are assuming that this current equation is true for all values of x, which means it should be true for any value of x that we choose. So let's choose some good values of x. Now, what makes an x a good value? Well, there are factors scattered all over the place, factor by definition being part of a multiplication problem. And if some of these factors were zero, then things would disappear. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna alternate letting x equal values that make each factor cancel. For example, the factor of x, which I'll just circle right here. I'll circle that highlight. Factor of x would be zero if I let x equal zero. Let's let x equal zero. And let's see what happens. Now, right here, if I let x equal zero, everything disappears except the negative one. Get a, we put zero here, we get negative one. Put zero here, we get positive two. But look at the other two factors, or add-ins, I should say. When x equals zero here, it's gonna kill the whole thing. And when x equals zero here, it's gonna kill the whole thing. So the rest of that is gone when x equals zero. And now we've got an equation that we can solve for a. This implies that negative one equals negative two a. And this implies that a equals one. We now know the first unknown numerator. The fraction, but big deal. All right, that's if we let x equal zero. But what about the second factor? This one right here, excuse me, erased. What about two x minus one? What would make that equal to zero? And the answer is one half. So if we let x equal one half, let's see what that does to the equation. It's gonna be a little bit more work here because of the squares and the fractions. But if we put in one half, we get one half squared, which is one fourth, plus two times one half, which is one minus one. We get one fourth plus one minus one. The ones cancel and it leaves us with one fourth. Okay. What happens if we put one fourth here and here? I'm sorry, one half. Well, one half was chosen because it zeroes out this factor, so that's gone. What if we put one half for x here and here? Well, none of those will disappear, so we need to keep track of this. We'll be left with a b, putting in one half for the first x gives us one half. Putting in one half of the second x gives us one half plus two, which is two and a half, which is five halves. And then putting in one half on the third term, half in there. Putting in one half on the third term will zero out here, so all that's gone. So by letting x equal one half, we got an equation that contains b only. This implies that one fourth is equal to five fourths b, and this implies that b is equal to one fifth. Not the most convenient numerators, but at least they're not unknown anymore. I take that back. We've got one more we got to figure out. Let's figure out uh, which. Let's figure out what to do with this factor. Well, that factor will be zero when x equals negative two. So let's let x equal negative two. If we let x equal negative two here, we'll get negative two squared, which is four, positive two times negative two, which is negative four. Those cancel, leaving us a negative one. Now, let's find the factors that disappear when x equals negative two. That's this factor, so this is gone. And this factor, so this is gone. So we can ignore the first two terms and just focus on this third term when x equals negative two. We have a c, x equals negative two in the first factor. And in the second factor right here, we have two times negative two, which is negative four, minus one is negative five. All right, this implies, by the way, if you missed it in a previous video, this double line arrow is a symbol for the word implies. It means one equation leads to another equation. It's not all it means, but it's good. That
that implies that negative one is equal to 10 C. And this implies that C is equal to negative one tenth. So what has this done for us? Well, it's kind of messy up top. So I'm gonna to try to clean up a bunch of the cross outs and everything. Um, what this has done for us is it has shown us how to take our original rational function, our original rational function, which I'm slowly recovering, and decompose it into its partial fraction decomposition. All we have to do now is, instead of, we actually haven't integrated anything yet, and that's not the purpose of this video. The purpose of this video was to illustrate partial fraction decomposition. So let's summarize what this means on the next page. So what conclusion can we draw? Recall that this symbol is the math symbol for the word therefore, usually used when we're drawing a conclusion. Well, we know that we're trying to decompose our original function into an expression that looks like this. Like that two down there, a little bit more two-ish. Not very two-ish right now. Okay. And we also discovered that A equals one-half, B equals one-fifth, and C equals negative one-tenth. Yes, the signs were correct. So all we have to do now is substitute those values. If I can actually get this to draw. Go. A is one-half, so we have one-half over X. B is one-fifth, so we have one-fifth over two X minus one. And C is negative one-tenth, so we have negative one-tenth over X plus two. Now there is a cleaner way to write this. We could write one-half times one over X plus one-fifth times one over two X minus one, then minus one-tenth times one over X plus two. They're equivalent, but in anticipation of integrating, I think the bottom line looks better than the middle. All right, in the next video, we're actually gonna integrate this function by taking advantage of this partial fraction decomposition.